This is Winfield Bible School 2019. Our speaking brother is our brother John Owen. The title for his series, Romans, the Righteousness of God, and for his first class, the title is The Just Shall Live by Faith. We've read Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 17 as an introduction. We'll now invite Brother John Owen forward for his first class. Good evening, brothers and sisters. So good to be with you. Thanks so much for the lovely welcome. Uh, Obviously, I I bring the love of uh, my brother and his wife, Rebecca, uh, who were with you last year. And uh, yeah, at the moment, they're in Europe and um, yeah, sending some some pictures and obviously having a great time, but they send a lot of love to you guys. So thank you so much for looking after them. And uh, yeah, I I hear you had a good time, so I'm a bit nervous about living up to it, but we'll give it a go, eh? Okay? And, you know, are we ever going to go in deep? Yes, we are. We're going to have a go at Romans. And honestly, if you snooze, you lose, okay? You, you've got to kind of be awake for this if we're going to try and follow this argument together and see if we can sort of bring some lessons out of Romans together. So, let's have a look at these opening verses then. So, Romans chapter 1. And you'll see that they focus on the gospel. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which the gospel he promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So there we go. This is what it's all about. It's all about the gospel. And what's at the center of the gospel? What's at the center of the good news? Verse 3, well, it's about his son. Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. And then we see the impact of the gospel. Verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also called of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the gospel, the good news that was promised to Abraham, to David, the the promise that we can have our sins forgiven, is centred in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his victory over sin and death. And that was ultimately shown in his resurrection. And God's grace is seen in the fact that he, as an almighty God, is willing for us to share that victory, if we'll believe it and obey it. Well, that is good news, isn't it? That's the gospel message that Paul felt obliged to share with everybody. Turn over to verse 14. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Whoever I can, I'm going to share this gospel message with. So much as is in me is, verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, within the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed, From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so what a great beginning to a letter. I'm writing with good news that can save you from death, if you'll believe it. And this is the crux. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And it's been pointed out that just in those few verses, and I'd just like to spend just the next 30 seconds writing everything on this slide down. Uh, so, so just in that, that couple of verses there, verse 16 and 17, can you see that the themes of the letter are being set up? I'm not ashamed, and we see the idea of being ashamed coming through there. Okay? So sin is something that we are ashamed of, but the good news of the gospel is the fact that our sins can be dealt with. So I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, okay? It's the power, and we see the idea of power coming through, the idea of salvation, of course, belief and faith coming through, Uh, the Jew and the Gentile, major theme going through the letter, Uh, the righteousness, the just, the righteous shall live by faith, and the idea of living there. So can you see that that's coming through? Now, these slides are your slides, you know, so please just come and give me a memory stick, you're welcome to help them, but uh, it's just interesting, isn't it, seeing those themes coming through there. Uh, And that little phrase, though, the just shall live by faith, is really what it's all about. 
I'm sure you know that it's from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. And if you didn't know, stick it in your margin, you know. Let's, let's learn together. Let's build our knowledge. Let's not be something that, that, you know, in 10 years' time we're looking at Romans and we've completely forgotten where we were. What we should be doing all the time, shouldn't we? Like our studies on Romans now should be phenomenal compared to the days of John Thomas and Robert Roberts. But you think of what's gone on in between time. But so often we sit as passive learners and, and we just have to start all over again. We should be on it, you know, pencils out, trying our best to see if we can build our knowledge on these things and, and learn more, pass that on to the next generation, and then the next generation hopefully could take us further again in, in learning about these wonderful things. So there we see that, that citation from Habakkuk is used in Romans, and it's been pointed out uh, by his brother John Martin, actually, that in Romans you've got the emphasis on faith. In Galatians, you've got the emphasis on being justified. And on, in Hebrews, you've got the emphasis on those who are living by that faith. Now, the literal translation in verse 17, where it says um, that there it is that so within the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Uh, the literal translation of that particular phrase is actually out of faith and for faith. Really important. Okay, so it's not just as simply um, as I would have kind of initially read it in terms of our, the, our faith growing from faith to faith. That we just say, okay, uh, our faith must be growing that. No, that's, I like that idea, but it's not simply what it's about. It's out of faith and for faith. And actually, I think that it, what it's about is it's out of God's faith, from his faithfulness, the gospel has come. And what we need to do is have faith, as it were, in God. So, from God's faith, it, God's righteousness is revealed through his faithfulness, through his truth. He is true to his principles. His purpose will stand. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have that shown to us. Let's just go back to verse 1 again. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So God's faithful plan of salvation is centred in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can be absolutely sure of God's faithfulness. And what we need to do is to respond in faith. And so that's what we're aiming for. And that's the purpose of our studies, to, to develop our faith together. Now, looking back to verse 17, I want you to see if you can notice here, there's a little contrast that's going to go on now. Okay, have a look. Can you see in verse 17... Through the righteousness of God, we, we see the gospel revealed, okay? So you see that revealed there in verse 17. Now, notice now the contrast against verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed in those who, rather than build their faith, hold down and suppress the truth. So can you see that? that so back to verse 17, in the gospel of Christ, Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold down the truth in unrighteousness. So rather than uh, through their faith, allow their, their faith to build, those who suppress it, the wrath of God is going to be revealed. And of course, what we then see in the rest of this chapter of Romans, and I recognise I'm speaking to people who, who no doubt have read through Romans many times. What we see from verse 18 to the end of this chapter is that the world that we live in is seeped in sin. And we know that to be true, don't we? Many people have chosen to ignore God. And it's not for us to say the amount of knowledge that somebody requires to be responsible in the eyes of God. But clearly, actually, the letter of Romans is focused on those who are responsible. People who have actually chosen to ignore God. Now, creation is a wonderful witness to God. And yet, man, in general, 
in their pride, have chosen to worship themselves over the Creator. And because they took that decision, God gave them up. Okay? He allowed us to fall into a state of mortality. But of course, the reason that God has allowed that is because he wants us to see there's a problem. And in seeing the problem, he hopes that we will then look to him for the solution. But what most people sadly have done in this world is seen the problem and pushed God even further away. But notice the repetition in here of the phrase, God gave them up. Okay? So you see it there in verse 24. God gave them up. I coloured it in red. You can choose whatever colour you like. Verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up. It's the same phrase there again. And in a sense, I think we've got a progression here. When we look to verse 24 and 25, we see there that God gave them up because they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And that really is a great summary of what happened in Eden. Man chose to serve the serpent, the, go after the words of the serpent, the creature, over the creator. And so mortality came upon us. Then verse 26, we see that cutting out God has led to changed behaviour. No God, no authority, no morals, no clear right or wrong. And so you can see from verse 26 and 27 that things are not as they were in the beginning when God made them and he made them one man and one woman and they together were one flesh. And so you can see that the rejection of God has led to a change in behaviour. So now there are no morals because God has been rejected. And, you know, I was getting the young people earlier to just have a think about how do you sort right and wrong when God is taken out of the equation? And the honest answer is it's impossible. It is absolutely impossible. And it's a huge struggle now. I work in education. We see it in schools. We see it with parents who, who come to us and say to us, and I work in a primary school, so the, the top age children are aged 11. We have a parent who will come in and say, you know, can you help me? Like they're looking at things on their phone and I know that they're, they're looking at stuff that they shouldn't be looking at, but, but what can I do about it? And we say to them, take the phone off them. But I can't. They're, they're telling me they've got these rights. I'm telling you, take the phone off them. But, but the, the, you know, what if I get into trouble with this? What? You're their parent. Take the phone off them. I try to be a bit politer to them, okay? But you, you can see that how this has gone wrong to such an extent now. That that parent, because they're, all they believe in is evolution, all they see themselves as some chemicals that are maybe, say they're 30 years old. They're 30 year old chemicals. The four year old that's four years old of chemicals, why should they take any notice of something that's 26 years older in terms of a bag of chemicals? Why would you? Why have you got authority? Why have you as a 93 year old bag of chemicals got any more authority to decide what's right and wrong? You see, when God has gone, morality goes. And that is what we're seeing in the progression here. So we end up with this universal problem. So we see in verse 28 that the whole lot is filled, verse 29, with all unrighteousness. It's a universal problem. And you see, he's taken us right back to Genesis in these verses here to show that this is something that's been there since those days. Both Jews and Gentiles, whoever, all are under the problem of sin. And, and the reason I put that up there is because sometimes we look at Romans and we say chapter 1 is all about the Gentiles and chapter 2 is all about the Jews. I disagree. Chapter 1 is showing the world that we live in, Jews and Gentiles, okay? And the reason those passages are there is because he's quoting passages about the Jews. Whoever you are, we are all under the problem of sin. And yet at the end of this chapter, we're in for a bit of a shock. Because yes, it's true that the world we live in is seeped 
in the problem of sin. And they have chosen to suppress the truth and cut God out. But actually, the focus here is on you and me. You see, many in our world today are living in utter ignorance of God. And God isn't going to hold them to account. His issue, verse 32, is us. People who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things, the things that we've just read about, that those which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. His issue is with you and with me. Chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. You. So I'll qualify. Chapter 2, I would say, deals with the man who thinks they're above the problems of chapter 1. This is the man who has the mindset of the Pharisee. I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. You see, that's the mindset of the man thinking he's okay. And that actually it's just everybody else who's got the problem. And we can see how easy it is for us to fall into that mindset. That it's easy for each one of us to look out the window and to say, the world out there, what a terrible place. And it's right, it is. But actually, we are part of that. And we need to understand that we too share in the problem of sin. You see, a key word now, which runs through chapter 2, in fact, six times you can see it, is in these first few verses, is the word judgest, okay? Let's just see it there. So every now and again, I'll, I'll stick this table up and you'll see their key words. And uh, as I've put with the asterisks, you know, that word is coming more times in Romans than any other book in the New Testament, okay? And obviously, therefore, in, in the Bible, because we're in the Greek now. So you can see that this word, idea of, of judging is a regular theme that's coming up. And you can see it just there in chapter 2 and verse 1. I can count it three times just in verse 1, then in verse 2, then twice in verse 3. So this is the theme that's coming through here. And again, like I, for me, I, I love choosing a colour, get it in. You know, I can see then that this is what is, is coming out here. And what these chapters are doing now is utterly condemning that mindset, which in the Ecclesia in Rome was mainly, mainly a Jewish issue. But I want you to notice that the Jew isn't personally addressed until verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew. So the personal address to the Jew doesn't come till more than halfway through this chapter, as it were. So at the beginning, the point is, you've got to look at yourself. Okay? You, O oh man. He doesn't say you, O oh Jew. He says you, O oh man. We've all got to look at this problem. And then later we see that, yeah, in this ecclesia, the Jews, there was an issue with them that we'll obviously come on to and explore. So the chapters prove, okay, chapters 1 and chapter 2, that whoever you are, you share the problem of sin. And so then, I know we're skipping a bit, but just look at verse 9 of chapter 3. He says, what then? And we'll look into this in more detail tomorrow. Are we better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. We have before proved, in chapters 1 and 2, both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. So let's recap a little bit then, just see where we've got to. The world at large is a wicked place. Chapter 1, verses 18 to 32. But so are you. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 16. And, and so are the Jews. They, they also need to recognise this. They, they thought that the law could make them righteous. So chapter 3 then says, all are under sin. And therefore, the only way that we can live is through the grace of God, which was ultimately shown in God's giving of his son. If we'll have faith in God's provision, we can have life. The just shall live by faith. And this was always God's plan. 
And you see what happens then in Romans is we get it's almost, this is what it's all about in chapters one to three. And don't worry, we're going to look at that into more detail. But then chapter four says, look back. That's always how it's been. Look back to the time of David. Look back to the time of Abraham. God has always required faith. Even go back to the time of Adam, chapter five. Okay? But then, you know, we go through the present, okay, from chapters five to chapters eight. Even then look to the future, chapters 9 to 11. Look how Israel will eventually come into the new covenant in the time of the kingdom. They will only be able to come in on the basis of faith. And then from chapter 12 we say, so now we get it. Let's live it. Let's put it into practice. And so the exhortation starts flowing through in chapter 12. And again, we'll, we'll just touch on that. But, you know, this is it, okay? We're, we're beginning to now see the argument which is going through Romans. First of all, you've got to understand that we're all seeped in the problem of sin. When you get that, when you realise you're on your knees, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Then it is that you can understand that the only way I can live is if I put my faith in God's provision, in his grace. Now I can live by faith. Now let's pause for a moment and think about this particular ecclesia in Rome. So we believe that Paul was inspired to write this in around AD 56 from Corinth and uh, that's while he was on his third preaching journey and we can just add a little bit more history to that now. So we know from Acts chapter 2 that on the day of Pentecost, okay, you can picture it can't you, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, that Jews from as far away as Rome were present. Okay, they were there in Jerusalem. Uh, they must have been fervent, dedicated individuals, mustn't they, to have made that journey. And on that day, they heard and saw wonderful things. And they realised that the Lord Jesus Christ was indeed the Christ, the Messiah. Now, we guess that of the 3,000 that were baptised, uh, just we'd assume that some of them would have been those from Rome. And so we can imagine as they then went back to Rome that they'd have set up a little ecclesia. But, but they hadn't necessarily forgotten their Jewish roots. Certainly they would have had Jewish relations who, who weren't converted. Now, now some years later, in, in, in AD 49, the Jews were then banished from Rome by Claudius. And so at that point, the Gentile brothers and sisters are left on their own to run this ecclesia for around five years. Okay? The Jews have been banished. They've had to go somebody else, somewhere else. So the Gentile brothers and sisters, they're getting on with it. Okay? But you can imagine they wouldn't have been concerned about keeping up with Jewish customs or anything like that. All those things would have just gone by the by and they would have just got on with the, the, the things that they would have considered normal in the running of the ecclesia. Now when the Jews returned, you can imagine the friction that this would have caused, that actually those things that they perhaps still held on to had suddenly been completely discarded from the ecclesia. And so the Jewish brothers and sisters would have perhaps started insisting on elements of the law that they felt should have still been kept. And I guess all of us at this point must be thinking, why didn't they just get it? Why didn't they just let go the law? Okay? Surely they could see that the law couldn't save but before we judge them, just think how challenging we find it as a community to distinguish between traditions and the things that truly matter. And we've been going how long? 150 years? 170 years? These traditions should be going for hundreds and hundreds of years, steeped in their culture. And so we can imagine how challenging it would have been. Uh, we know from later parts of Romans that they were pressing circumcision, you know. Well, surely circumcision, why, how would that be a bad thing? Why wouldn't we circumcise our children? We'd like teach them to cut off the flesh. That, that, it's not to do with the fact we wouldn't be saved. Surely we should do that. And we can imagine, can't we, okay, how that would have held. Again, like, I almost don't want to open up issues because I don't know if I'll open up something here which is a really touchy one. But, you know, I can guarantee that in your ecclesias there will be stuff like there is in my ecclesia, okay. In my ecclesia, it'd be something like the piano, okay, that would say, uh, sh should we have a go at playing the piano? Kind of, oh, the organ is sacred, okay? And, and you know, and you, you say, oh, um, would, you, would you mind showing the verse about that? 
Oh, don't you dare be so cheeky. The organ is sacred, you know. We always use the organ. That's how we use that. That's what we, that proper music comes from, okay? Now, I'm not, genuinely, like, whilst I can't help myself being a bit naughty, the fact is, I'm not knocking it. I understand that, at, you know, once upon a time, a decision was taken. This is what we should do. Things have worked. It's kept a decorum in the ecclesia. We sort of understand. So we end up holding on to something. But there is just a silly example of it. It's something that all of us, if we sit down one-on-one, -on -one, would actually say, yeah, of course we understand. It's not the building end. It's just something that we think we should hold on to. So can you see how that would have been such a difficulty in the ecclesia here, where you've got Jews who are saying, well, sh surely we should hold, well, isn't it a good thing that we still hold on to the Sabbath as a, as a day, where we just have a day of rest and contemplation with our family? Surely that's a good thing for us to do? Yeah, but it's not something you have to do. And so you can see how this, this friction would have perhaps built up. Now the apostle then is proving the importance of his understanding that no law, nothing like that, can make us righteous. The law given through Moses highlighted the magnitude of the problem of sin and helped you to, to see the solution. You know, that in the end it pointed, didn't it? It was the schoolmaster to take us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It helped us to see that actually you can't save yourself. That was the point of the law. God wants man to recognise the problem of sin in their lives. I'm going to say God wants man to realise. In the end, that's individuals. It's you and it's me. We don't need to worry about mankind in general. What we need to do is see the problem in ourselves. That's the focus on you and I. Verse 1 of chapter 2 again. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. So there are people in the world, and there are people then, who had no idea of God. The sad consequence of men of bygone ages choosing to reject God. But this letter is focusing on those who have the opportunity to be saved through their knowledge of God. People like you and I. And we need to be clear what the basis of that salvation is. The Jews in the first century had come to the mistaken conclusion that, that being descendants of Abraham, who had been given the sign of circumcision by God, that, that meant that they were in this such a special relationship with God that they could live as they pleased, uh, and God would save them regardless. And the apostle is saying, those who know the will of God, and yet continue to live sinful lives, doing the very things that they know that God hates, they're the ones in real danger. So, let's get into chapter 2 again. If you're judging others, yet you're doing those very things, how hypocritical. Verse 2. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. Now, can you see the word commit? Okay, we're looking back, aren't we, to verse 32 of verse chapter 1. So it's the, the connection is there. We're following the argument all the time. Okay, those who commit those things that were listed in chapter 1, that's coming up now again in chapter 2 and verse 2. Thinkest thou this, O man? that judgest them which do such things, and dost the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. We know God hates that behaviour, and he will judge it. Verse 4. Despisest thou the riches of God's goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. So, you see, knowing God's character of goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering should be the motivation for us to change. It should lead us to repentance. Not simply externally, but knowing God should cause us to repent from sin. It should affect our hearts, our consciences. But, instead, the apostle has to say, but, verse 5, after thy hardness, an impenitent heart, treasurest up, unto thyself, wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgments of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. 
To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honour and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. And so on the day of judgment, there will be two camps. We have a choice. We'll be amongst those who've responded to the knowledge that we have and changed our lives to reflect that. Or are we doing our own thing and not obeying the truth, changing the truth of God into a lie? That's what the world did. Now the next little passage from verse 12 to 16 isn't easy. It's a challenge, okay? But let's just slow down and have a little go at understanding this together. And remember that we're in a karaoke, okay? We are in a joint study together, okay? So I want you guys to be looking at this and through the week feeding me. And the cool thing is then, because I stand here, I can feed it back into everybody else as well, okay? So if we're working on this together, if we're studying Romans together, then what a good thing. Together, we're going to, uh, to learn more here. So let's have a look, verse 12 and verse, to verse 16. Now, the first thing I want you to notice is how that this passage has some key themes which are repeated later in the letter. So can you follow this on the screen now, okay? So let, let's have a go at this now. Can you see that in verse 12, as many have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And can you see that that idea of sinning in the law, breaking the law, is repeated then in verse 23. So it's exactly the same sort of thing is coming through. Verse 13, the doers of the law shall be justified. We see in verse 25, circumcision verily profiteth if thou be a doer of the law. Can you see that the, the ideas are being repeated? Are you with me? Good. Great. The Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. Shall not uncircumcision, the Gentiles, which is by nature, if it fulfil the law, do the things in the law, judge thee. And then he says, that talks about showing the works of the law written in their hearts and he makes the point in verse 29 circumcision is that of the heart so hopefully you can just see there that these verses that we find a bit tricky these the themes in them come out again towards the end of the letter and that's helpful because we can then use the parallel to help us to explain now it's not on the screen now but look in your Bible and you'll see that verse 12 starts with a premise. As many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And there in my margin I've put Psalm 49 and verse 20. Man that is in honour and understandeth not is like the beasts that perish. If you don't know if you've not had the law, if you don't know about it, okay, and you die, and you sin, well, you'll perish, okay? You'll perish without the law, okay? That's where you will end up, in the grave. However, if you sin with knowledge, it's right that you're judged accordingly. You're breaking the law. Someone who knows God's laws and isn't led to repentance is not going to be made righteous by God. The judgment is based on our reaction to God's law. Knowledge on itself, on itself doesn't save. God will judge you on what we do with that knowledge. So remember then in verse 12 and 13, the key point is that if you know God's laws and you ignore them, you're in a very dangerous place. And there were Jews within this ecclesia who had convinced themselves that because God had given them the law, they were sorted. Just because God had given them the law. Having the law alone doesn't save us. You need to keep it. And again, what a good lesson that is for us. That as Christadelphians, we can feel privileged, can't we, to, to, to be past the truth. Now, what a privilege that is. But just having it on its own will not save us. It's what we do with it that God is interested in. 
Now in verses 14 and 15, the apostle is saying that there are Gentiles who weren't given a law, as the Jews were, and yet they were coming to a knowledge of the truth and putting the Jews within the ecclesia to shame. Uh, and the Jews in the ecclesia were looking down on those Gentiles and, and had a lot of advice for them. And you can see that advice just coming through. We'll skip a bit. Come to verse 17. It says, Behold, thou art called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God and you know his will and approve the things that are more excellent being instructed out of the law. And you're confident that you are yourself are a guide of the blind a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles, through you, as it is written. And so you can see that the Jews had all this knowledge, and they had this advice then for everybody else about how they should change themselves. And yet actually they were committing the very things that they were saying to everyone else they shouldn't do. And they thought that they were okay, because they had been the ones who had been given the law by God. They were in this special relationship, so they could do whatever they wanted and how mistaken they were. And yet the Gentile brothers and sisters, in contrast, who hadn't grown up with the law, were taking the law into their heart, verses 14 and 15. They're taking it into their heart. It wasn't for them about external rituals. Now, we can get a good example of this, and that, what a help that is always, when we're able to see an example of this in Scripture. You see, a good example of a Gentile convert who grasped the gospel and came into the truth was Cornelius, ironically, a Roman centurion. We may have a hint to look at his example. Let, let me show you why I think that. Can you look at verse 11 again? Do you notice in your margin a cross-reference against verse 11? Has anyone got Acts 10 and verse 34? Great, so a few of you have. Super. If not, don't worry, stick it in now. Okay, I've stuck it on the screen for you. Acts 10, verse 34 and 35. Okay, that God is no respecter of persons. This is what's coming through here now. Okay, so we're immediately starting to think about Cornelius. Well, what about this? That was at the beginning of the section. Now look at verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Does anyone else have a, another cross-reference in their margin? I've got another one. And again, interestingly, I'll stick it on the screen for you. It goes to Acts 10 and verse 42 this time. So how interesting that just almost sort of putting as the bookends around this little difficult section, we've got a quote from Acts 10 twice, one at the beginning, one at the end, regarding Cornelius, a Roman who was converted. What an interesting thing to be able to see here. So surely we need to just give this a little bit of thought. We remember that in Acts 10, Peter, the Jew, was preaching to Cornelius, the Gentile. And the Jews in this ecclesia now in Rome needed to learn the same lesson that Peter had learnt. Now, in connection with this, I want you to also notice in verse 24 of Romans 2, there's a citation from Isaiah 52. Can you see that? Again, this isn't something we're going to look at together now, but I just, I'll throw this out to you. It's worth making a colour for citations from Isaiah, masses of citations from Isaiah through Romans. So I think Isaiah speaks of the gospel, okay? And here we see that in Romans. But here, God, through the prophet, in Isaiah 52, and I stuck it on the screen for you here, it was saying that while they were living in captivity under the Assyrians, God's name was being blasphemed. And Isaiah describes that captivity as oppressing. It was a band over the neck. And the ultimate answer 
of what would set them free from that oppression was the gospel. Now, I don't know if you can picture Isaiah 52, okay? Hopefully some of you can. You can remember that carrying on from these verses now, we get the fact, so that, that's that point I was just making, but we get the point, so we're still in Isaiah 52. We left off in verse 5, we now carry on. The answer to the oppression is the gospel, okay? The answer to the oppression is the gospel. Crucial, okay? So there in Isaiah 52, this passage which is being cited here, the answer to the oppressive force of the Assyrians was the gospel, the good news, those coming on the mountains, telling them about the fact that God reigns, okay? Salvation would come. I'm starting to get, this is really interesting. So Paul is inspired to cite this passage here in Romans. But here's what's so ironic about this. The context now, the oppressive force is no longer in here, in Romans 2, the Gentiles. Now, it's the Jews. Now, come here into Acts 15. Hold Romans 2, come to Acts 15. So the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, because of the Jews. Whereas in Isaiah... The name of God was blasphemed because of the Assyrians oppressing. Now in Romans, the name of God is being blasphemed because of the way that the Jews are insisting on their law. And it's becoming an oppressive force, just like the Assyrians were an oppressive force. It's putting men into shackles, just like the Assyrians would have been putting men into shackles. So here in Acts chapter 15, Peter at the Jerusalem Council, having now learnt the need to leave the law alone, recounts once more the fact that the Gentiles had been called. Look what he says in verse 10. Wherefore why tempt ye God, look, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples. So the law was being used to oppress as a yoke upon the neck. Now come back to Romans 2 and see now the relevance of this citation. The Jews had turned the law into something that was holding men captive. How interesting is that? Okay, just to, to see is this concept, the wonder of scripture here. So I, I, I'm kind of looking at you and I know that it's kind of 10 to 8 and we're all just feeling a little bit snoozy, and a, but like you're only gonna get this if, like, if I go through it for the 45th time. So here we go again, right? So he's quoting this passage in Isaiah. In Isaiah, he's saying that the Assyrians were oppressing them and that was causing them to blaspheme the name of God. But he quotes that in Romans and he turns it round and says, it's you, the Jews, who by using the law as this means of shackling people like the Assyrians did, you are causing men to blaspheme God. What an interesting thing that is. Now back in Isaiah, as I mentioned, the answer to the oppression was the gospel message. Well, guess what the answer is in Romans? The gospel message, of course. There it is now, in Romans 10, citing from Isaiah 52 again, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And even more exciting, that passage is what's cited next in Acts chapter 10, when Peter was speaking to Cornelius. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching good tidings of peace, Isaiah 52, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the answer to any oppressor is the gospel. Be it captivity, a misused law, ultimately sin, the Lord Jesus Christ has led captivity captive. The gospel sets us free, free from the problem of sin and death. And so what have we learned so far? Well, the apostle has shown us the good news, the gospel, that God is willing to save us if we'll put our faith in him. The just shall live by faith. To live by faith doesn't mean to do nothing. We need to start by recognizing the problem of sin in our lives, not just in the world we live in, but in our lives. And we've seen that we can very easily become like those Jews who, who thought that having been given the word, that was enough. We need to be hearers and doers. And our faith comes from hearing the word. 
But faith without works is dead. So we need to live it. Verse 28. He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, and a Jew just means one whose praise is of God. You know, that's Jew means praise, Jew to praise. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is out of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So let's finish. You've got to know the argument. So let's make sure we've got it in our minds, brothers and sisters. Are you ready? Okay, you need to learn this by the end of this week. So, verses 1 to 17 of chapter 1 is the introduction. Okay, what does it teach us? Okay, there in the introduction he shows us the just shall live by Great, okay? Romans 1, verses 1 to 17. We've got that clear in our minds. There it is, the intro. The just shall live by faith. Why will the just live by faith? Because there is no other way. Look at the world we live in. Verse 18 to the end of chapter 1. The world we live in is seeped in sin. It, it, the, men have, have pushed God away. Morality has fallen apart. But, chapter 2. So, you are also part of that problem. You need to recognise the problem of sin in yourself. All are under sin, Jews and Gentiles. Going back to the time of Genesis, the whole lot of us are in it. So what do we do? Well, chapter 3, we're going to look at tomorrow now, shows us that we need to look to God's provision in the Lord Jesus Christ, who he set forth to, be, to declare his righteousness. And you know, that's always been what God wants. God has always wanted faith. Look back to the time of David, to the time of Abraham, chapter 4, okay? And recognise that if you're worried about your sin, God's grace is sufficient, chapter 5. So get on board with it. Get on board with it in baptism. Make your baptism the reality of your life. Serve righteousness. And of course that's going to be difficult, chapter 7. The things that you want to do, you don't do. And the things that you don't want to do, you do do. But if you want to be in the kingdom, if you make your delight in God's ways, there is so much on your side. The Lord God will help you to get to that kingdom.